A staff writer at The New Yorker for more than three decades, Adam Gopnik is the author of Paris to the Moon, The Table Comes First, At the Stranger's Gate, and A Thousand Small Sanities, referred to by The New York Times as a witty, humane, learned defense of liberalism amidst the dogmatic divisions of our time. He is also a sought-after public speaker, uh, a widely anthologized essayist, and has collaborated as both a librettist and lyric writer on several musical projects. A three-time recipient of the National Magazine Award and a winner of the George Polk Award for Magazine Reporting, uh, he was decorated with the French Republic's Medal of Chevalier of the Order of Arts and Letters. No, I will not say that in French. He joins us tonight with his latest work, The Real Work on the, mastery, on the Mystery of Mastery, an examination of the fundamental question of just how it is that we acquire skills. It delves into the processes used by a variety of master artists, professionals, and instructors. These pursuits that he took up during this time include drawing, driving, magic, bread making, boxing, overcoming a phobia, and an even bigger phobia of mine, ballroom dancing. <laughs> a review in the Financial Times calls this book extremely moving. The joy of this book is its honesty. It reads, the real work is a term magicians use to define who's really got the chops. Gopnik may not be able to handle a deck of cards, but he is a magician all the same. And hey, speaking of magicians, we have a special guest tonight. We're excited to welcome magician uh, Justin Gilmore to our stage. Uh, who, yes, he did not disappear. He is right there. <laughs> Aside from his work as an illusionist, Justin owns his own record label, is an artist, is a tennis coach, and most happily, a lifelong Philadelphian. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming tonight's guests. Thank you for coming. Um, it is always a special pleasure and, uh, and an honor to speak here at the Free Library of Philadelphia. It's one of the most uh, enchanted titles, I think, that any building or any institution could hold, the Free Library. We don't meditate often enough, I think, on what an extraordinary idea that is and what a remarkable liberal, in the broad sense, institution it represents. Uh, I, as some of you may know, I grew up here. I was born here. Uh, this, the Franklin Institute, the Art Museum, this place are, in the deepest sense, sacred, secular places to me. And I could not be happier to be here um, to talk about the real work. Now, the real work is the title of my book, but it's a title borrowed from a concept peculiar to magicians. Uh, when I trailed my then 13-year-old son, Luke, to Las Vegas, and if you haven't trailed your 13-year-old son to Las Vegas, <laughs> I assure you, you have not lived. But I trailed him to Las Vegas because, like so many 13-year-old uh, boys and girls, he had become obsessed with the high art of card magic. And while I was there, uh, I began to hear the magicians who would gather around uh, uh, a table at 3 a.m., and if you haven't taken your son to a 3 a.m. table, <laughs> in a lounge in Las Vegas, you haven't lived. And they would talk about the real work. They would say, the real work, who's got the real work on Floss's illusion or the Erdnay's color change? Who's got the real work on that? And I was fascinated, I wondered, what did they mean by this expression, the real work? And then over time, I came to understand that they didn't mean who had done it first. And they didn't mean who had done it most spectacularly, even if it was a grand illusion. No, they meant who had done it with the greatest mix of technical virtuosity and human vibration with the greatest mix of uh, adeptness and empathy for what the audience was experiencing. And that concept came to uh, electrify and impel this book. But before I talk about the book, let's see a little bit of the real work. Would you welcome, please, my companion for this evening, and I feel incredibly privileged to have him, Justin Gilmore. So happy to have everyone here. Uh, as Adam mentioned, I am a lifelong Philadelphian, and uh, I perform a weekly magic show over at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia uh, every Wednesday, 12 to 1. Uh, and actually, as part of that show, I teach the kids how to perform uh, a trick or two or three at the end of every program. And uh, speaking with Adam before tonight's uh, program, we're actually going to teach you all how to perform 
an awesome card trick at the end of tonight's program. All right? So anyone that has a deck of cards with them, you'll be, you'll be well prepared. And if you don't, it's, trust me, a simple enough card trick. You'll be able to kind of absorb it, go home, and uh, do the work yourself. Uh, Adam Gopnik was nice enough, kind enough, to sign this uh, playing card right here. It says, the real work has his initials, and it has today's date, 3-21-23. What we're going to do with this card is we're going to take it, put it about halfway down into this pack, and I'm going to say, one, two, three, the real work, and it's going to come to the top just like that. <laughs> Didn't do it. Okay. <laughs> Here's the thing. We can always get further together than one of us by ourselves. So I'd like all of us together to say the real work on three. Are we ready? One, two, three. The real work. There we go. It was pretty solid. And there we go. There, it's come to the top. Now we're going to try this again. We're going to try this with a little more impossibility. We're going to go about two-thirds of the way down into that pack. All right? The real work. I said that very enthusiastically. It should work then. <laughs> oh, didn't work there. That's because I did it by myself, right? We know the routine at this point. Are we ready? One, two, three. The real work. Oh, that sounds beautiful. And let's see. <laughs> and there it is, everyone. The real work. Now, I know some of you over there may have a little hard time seeing that. We're going to make this a little more palatable. I'm going to place the top half of the deck right down there. And now we're going to do this with just the lower portion of the pack. And as I'll explain in a moment, when we eliminate cards as magicians, we're actually kind of eliminating some of the different sneaky ways that we can kind of manipulate your uh, attention, misdirection and stuff. So with the lower half of the deck now, we're going to get real deep into the fractions now, two-thirds of the way down into that lower portion. <sighs> deep breath, because I'm... I'm a little nervous, I'm a little excited. That's why I think I was rushing and doing that by myself. We know, though, that teamwork makes the dream work, as cliche and cheesy as that sounds. One, two, three. The real work. Oh, it's beautiful, it sounds nice, and look at that. And there it's, all right, let's lift our volumes a little bit. So if you were kind of subdued on that one and you were at like a four or five, yeah, let's crank it up to like a eight, nine, 10 kind of a volume, all right? We need that enthusiasm. We're going to get that card to rise up to the top of the deck, even though it's just the lower portion here. Fewer cards. One, two, three. The real work. Oh, yeah, that really <laughs> rang out. And there it is. Oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, OK. One more try here. Ready? One, two, three. The real work. I know it worked. Oh. All right, hold on a sec. I'm having a strange thought here, people. Are we? Remember something. I placed the top half of the pack over there. Now, it would seem impossible, but if teamwork really made the dream work, this is the top. And there it is. <laughs> Make some noise for ourselves and teamwork making the dream work. Now look, I already told Adam backstage here, he's gonna have to not report me to some of the magicians because some magicians get a little uptight about what we refer to as exposure when you kind of reveal how a trick works, okay? But what we're gonna do tonight is kind of take you behind the curtain just a little bit. So there's something interesting about a deck of cards. There's a lot of tie-in to our natural world around us. There are 13 values in each suit, 13 phases of the moon, four suits for four seasons. And the one that really blows my mind, if you add up all of the values in a deck of cards uh, with a certain fraction, back to the fractions again, uh, for jokers, it adds up to 365 or 364 point whatever, literally a calendar year. So there's a lot of cool tie-in. But all that to be said, Magicians with a full pack of cards, we think about this conceptually as a pack of cards, one thing. But if you really think about this as 52 different cards, that's a lot of opportunity for a magician who's adept with misdirection to kind of make you look over here while we do something over here. So I'm going to show you all a little bit some of the sneaky things that we magicians do to kind of uh, distract you a little bit and, and fool you, trick you. But you're going to start to catch me. You all are going to start to catch me. 
And as you do, do me a favor, let's not boo, let's not throw your refreshments at me, because it's happened before, but just sort of give me a little, a little knowing smirk, and I'll kind of see where, when people are kind of getting on board here. So we're going to use a five, the four, the three, the two, and the one. Now you'll notice that one is uh, an ace, right? But we're calling that a one for this demonstration. Anyone who plays cards knows uh, the ace can kind of be valued at, at a one or uh, a higher value. So we, again, we have the one, the two, the three, the four, and the five. Not too many cards to follow, right? We're simplifying things. Five's on the top, one's on the bottom, not too wild. But if I turn it face down now, now we have the one on the top and the five on the bottom, right? So far, so what? Everyone's like, all right, dude, what, what's up with this? Watch the one as it goes in between the two and the three. I'm gonna to start to do some of my sneaky little moves here. The real work, even though I put it in between the two and the three, pops back up to the top. Now watch, we'll put it in a couple down from the top here. The real work, and there it is, comes back to the top again. Now I'm gonna get rid of that one, and that leaves us next up with, of course, the two, all right? Now the two goes in a few down from the top, and again, Bless you. Comes right back to the top. Perfect misdirection. That was, exactly what we, that was exactly what we discussed ahead of time. Now, the three is where things start to get a little bit tricky because now there's really just a one card advantage. Watch that three goes face down between the four and the five. You all saw me flip it face up though, didn't you? Right? But see, you still can't quite trust your eyes here. Watch that three as it goes face up between the four and the five. At that time it was face down, wasn't it? But again, we still can't trust our eyes because that three is being a little tricky. It's that one card advantage. We'll get rid of the three. And that leaves us with the four and the five. And here's, this is wild. The number one thing magicians get accused of, stashing things up our <laughs> sleeves, which I think Adam will tell you, it's actually a fairly lost art in magic. Uh, and moving very quickly. The hand is quicker than the eye. Common misconception. So I'm going to do this very slowly. There's that four. It goes underneath. You can see the five going on top. But even with two cards, the real work, there you go, the four comes back to the top. Now we'll get rid of the four, and now I'm in trouble. Because <laughs> now there's no cover card. There's nothing to do in terms of misdirection. Everything I just showed you was kind of sleight of hand, misdirection kind of stuff, right? But now I don't even have a cover card. I could really put the five on top of my palm, underneath it. There's not a ton of things we can do with this. But what I'd like us all to do is reconnect with our teamwork, and on the count of three, we're all going to say our magic phrase, right? One, two, three. The, the real work. work. <laughs> oh, and there we go. And we turn that last one into <laughs> our real work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to keep this as a key trophy of this tour. Um, Justin, that's wonderful. It's wonderful to watch your work. Thank you. Thank you. The reason I was so overjoyed when Justin volunteered to work with me tonight and to open our show is exactly because one of the key themes in the book, as you know, is magic. And I love magic for its own sake, and I, but I prefer the company of magicians to the company of any other group of people I've spent time with. They're more interesting than artists. They're more interesting than cooks. They're more interesting than boxers. They're more interesting than anyone. And it's in part, I think, because um, as my friend Jamie in Swiss, who's sort of the, the, my lead, my guide into this world, uh, said to me once, um, every other art form has a, a technique has to be transparent. In magic, it has, technique has to be invisible. Right. You know, and you can't talk about it with anyone except another magician, right? Yeah. So uh, it, do it. But the key thing that I learned, I think I learned in my, in my time among the magicians, is something I'd love you to talk a little bit about, uh, Justin, and that is that you don't, yes, of course, you have to have a beautiful technique of the kind you have. You have to be able to do things with your fingers that I can't and, our, and the folks in the room can't. But you don't do magic with your fingers. You do magic with your mind, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, tech, there's technique, uh, but that is, uh, only takes you to a certain point. Yeah. You know, if you're looking for real moments, it takes, I think, unpacking and sort of building things around that technique. Um, for me, a lot, of, a lot of stuff is developed through just repetition. Uh -huh. um, in repeating something, I think every time we repeat something, anything, there's an opportunity to make a new mistake or make a better mistake. Right. Uh -huh. And you're going to maybe be able to figure out a weak spot in the thing that you hadn't felt before. 
So creative repetition isn't just mechanical, is what you're saying. It isn't yes. just. So for instance, that, that last yeah. piece I just showed, I was doing some corporate work for a big box store a couple months ago, and I was performing that trick, and I got to that sort of point where the, the surprise ending was about to be upon us. And it was actually in the phase before when it was down to the two cards. And this woman points at, at the thing. She's like, that's not our card anymore. <laughs> that's the, you know, she, yeah, knew, it, she predicted it, right. the ending. And it really kind of stuck with me in a way. And I was like, ah, oh, damn, she, she saw that too early. <laughs> it's like someone sitting in the movie theater that yeah. gets the surprise ending yeah, yeah. a little too soon. So I He's went, wearing a mask. I went yeah. back to my hotel room and I literally just sort of rewound the routine. And I kind of just, dis I had this eureka moment where I discovered that there was an additional display showing that five going on top. Right. So I've probably performed that routine separately and combined, you know, four to 600 times mm -hmm. in my life. And it was on performance maybe 503 <laughs> right. when this thing happened and it made me go back and re-examine it. And now to me, it kind of just takes it to another yeah. level where I'm backing that person into the corner a little more effectively right. to where the surprise ending is going to most likely be a bit more So you're shocking. constantly engaged in the act of anticipation, right? You're trying to anticipate what people expect and always end up one step ahead of that anticipation. That, yeah, that, and I think also something I've embraced recently is being, a, um, I used to go into my show and I would have my patter, my script for the thing, and I would sometimes power through that so powerfully or so sort of uh, focused without pausing that I would sometimes miss a moment, like an organic right. moment that happened in, in the room. Yeah. Or sometimes yeah. I'll make a mistake. I've had tricks just, I, I start to do something and it just fails miserably and it's actually hilarious. Yes. And if I don't run away from the awkwardness of that moment and go like, oh my God, I made a mistake, and we kind of make a little moment out of it, some of those mistakes have actually become things that I've incorporated later. Yeah. Like yeah. someone says something that's prompted by something and then I start to think, how can I manufacture the performance every night so that most likely someone will have yeah, that. that happen? And then the key is to pivot into the next piece without, yeah, without, yeah. without stumbling on it. And that Absolutely. Way too. But you incorporate the error into the final performance. What, was, what began as an error becomes part of the fabric of the performance. Yeah, and I feel like really what that boils down to is just acknowledging that like tonight, everyone who's in here, one person isn't here, it's a different energy in yeah, this room. Yeah. Every, every the room, atmosphere, every so group right. is its own organic, real thing, and it needs to be kind of respected and valued. That, that is terrific, Justin. If you'll retake your seat, yes. I will expound on everything you, you just said in a far more obscure way. Justin Gilmore. Not to um, digress too much, but I was a child actor here in Philadelphia, and somebody just sent me from, from here uh, photographs of me at the age of five at the old playhouse in the park, projecting admirably out. <laughs> Now I'm older and they hand me a microphone. I got interested in this whole question of the real work and the nature of mastery, how it is we go about learning to do new and difficult things, even in late middle age, if I can so describe myself, exactly because I became first obsessed or concerned about the difference between accomplishment and achievement and how we were directing those two things in our children's lives. That was the real impetus, the real impelling incident of this entire inquiry which produced my new book, The Real Work. Um, and thank you for selling the book um, so well with the audience. It kind of had a kind of hypnotic power <laughs> on everyone. What do I mean by that difference between accomplishment and achievement? Well, achievement seems to me the thing that we drive our kids to do over and over again. Achievement is the next test you have to pass. Achievement is the next school you have to get into. Achievement is jumping over the hurdle that your parents, society, the school has set for you in a way that's predetermined, pre-shaped by authority. Achievement is important. We all seek out achievement. There are reasons why we need it. God bless achievement. But it began to seem to me as I watched my kids ever more driven in the direction of, of that kind of achievement that they were missing something. And I noticed that in their own lives, they were drawn to things that I could only describe as accomplishments, things that had no obvious value, things that weren't, wouldn't be rewarded by the structure of authority, but that had sneaked deeply into their own selves and their own souls and given them a sense of value independent, autonomous 
of those institutions of authority. I saw it, first of all, with my son Luke when he was 13 and became obsessed with card magic. Now, this was not something that the school was crazy about. But I began to see somewhat rebelliously that he was learning more from mastering the Erdnay's color change than he was learning necessarily from doing a trigonometry class. He was learning perseverance, he was learning uh, stick to itiveness, but he was also, and he was learning above all, the value exactly of repetition, that through repetition we increase our understanding, but he was also building a kind of foundation for his own sense of self. He was seeing that he, could, that he could do things that other people couldn't, and that those things were things that he could accomplish for himself, that they weren't being imposed by someone outside him. And it made me reflect on my own history and made me think again about how I had grown up and remembered suddenly that when I was 12 years old, on 41st and Locust Street, I got a $40 guitar and a book of Beatle chords, and I taught myself a C chord and an E minor chord and an F chord laboriously over weeks and weeks of practice and research. And that accomplishment has been the foundation for my sense of possibility ever since. Whenever I'm stuck on a paragraph or a piece or a book, I remember I taught myself to play Yellow Submarine. I can teach myself <laughs> to do this. I mean that very seriously. And I think if you ask yourselves or you ask anyone, when was it that you first felt capable in the world. It wasn't the moment when you passed the test. It was the moment when you made, created a test for yourself that you then passed to your own satisfaction. And that sense of autonomy and accomplishment is something that we have significantly drained, certainly from our children's lives and I think from our, our own lives. So in advanced middle age, I wanted to go back to, not back to school so much, but back to myself. And I began to pursue uh, not deliberately, not in a schematic way, but as each thing appeared to me over the past 15 years, and I felt a sense of inner necessity in pursuing it, I began to pursue a, a whole host of new accomplishments that not only had I never pursued before, but that I had never thought I was capable of pursuing. And what I learned in the pursuit, and what I try to write about in the, in the real work in the series of essays, is first of all, that I will never be good at any of the things I tried to do. <laughs> and that's fine. This is a series of comic essays about inadequacy. It's not a series of how-to lessons in doing things. As I say at the beginning of the book, this is a self-help book that won't help. It won't help you, that is, learn how to do things. It'll give you shortcuts or recipes for learning how to do things. What I hope is, is that it's a self-help book that will help you contemplate your own self and your children's selves and, our, and our, our neighbors' selves and think about how it is that we construct ourselves not just through the inner work of psychological turmoil and growth, but through the outer engagement we make with things we want to learn to do. So the first thing I set myself to learn to do, having spent time among the magicians watching how they worked, was uh, drawing. Because I'd spent 40 years of my life as a working art critic for a noted magazine, and I had absolutely no idea how to draw a naked body if you put one in front of me. I would be in a state of panic. I would be in a state of panic anyway, probably. But I would particularly be in a state of panic if you asked me to depict it. Now, that's perfectly respectable in a way. That's not something to be ashamed of. The act of judging and of criticizing is different from the act of doing. We don't uh, criticize a sports writer who can't hit a 100 mile per hour fastball. That's part of what being the difference between being a sports writer and a ball player, that and $20 million. But <laughs> at the same time, if, we, if you're a sports writer and you've never had the experience of swinging at a 50 mile per hour fastball, in some deep sense, you won't fully empathize with the task that the people you're writing about are facing every day. You will never be able to do it yourself, but you may be able to understand what the real challenge, not just the seeming challenge of that action is. So I went to work to learn how to draw after all these years, and it was the most frustrating thing I've ever attempted. Uh, I'm no good at it. I held the pencil wrong. I didn't know where to look. I didn't know what to do. And I was studying with a wonderfully reactionary, old-fashioned 
uh, representational painter named Jacob Collins. Now, Jacob was one of the most interesting men I met along this pursuit, along this pathway of pursuit. I began this, uh, this tour with my friend Malcolm Gladwell in New York, and he said to me, you know, this book really isn't about uh, accomplishments so much, it's about you falling in love with a lot of teachers. And I think that's probably true, and probably has, has, has deep psychological roots that we can contemplate later. But Jacob was a fascinating teacher to me because, as some of you may know, I've written about modern art uh, over the years. I, I've been an advocate, not only for the great masters, for Van Gogh and Picasso and Matisse, spoken often here at the Philadelphia Museum about the tradition of the modern still life and so on. But I've even been an advocate and an appreciator of the farthest reaches of the avant-garde right up through Damien Hirst and, God help me, Jeff Koons. <laughs> Jacob thought, and still thinks, stubbornly and surely, that art took a fundamentally wrong turn around 1855, and everything that has happened since is a catastrophe. <laughs> well, you can imagine what a challenging and bracing presence that was to be with week after week in a little atelier in, on the east side of Manhattan, facing week after week the problem of staring at a naked body and trying to translate it in some way into a recognizable drawing while watching Jacob do it at an enormous level of virtuosity. Well, here what was fascinating to me about Jacob's teaching method, how I began at least to get a taste of what it is to do life drawing. You might think that what a drawing teacher would tell you is, look harder, think more, see deeper, see better. But of course, that's the kind of uh, command that not only is completely meaningless when you're given it, but is sends you backwards, not forward. Instead, Jacob began to give me a whole little set of what I thought of as subroutines, of little schemata, little tasks, little stubborn steps that I had to master. When I was set the task of drawing a face, he said to me, forget the features that you see, because we all see the features on a human face through what he called the symbol set of our acquired representations of it. And it's true, on, on this tour, I've sometimes asked people at the beginning of, uh, of my talk to draw the face of the person sitting next to them. Um, since we had Justin tonight, I decided to skip that step. But what's fascinating about it is we all draw a face in the same way, unless we're a trained and more accomplished uh, artist. We all tend to draw uh, the face smaller than it actually is, features much larger than they really are, because features are what we pay attention to. Features are what we get information about emotion, meaning, fear from. We make eyes into big circles, noses into triangles, mouths into bananas. We all have a symbol set of a face that we deal with and that we struggle to escape in order to draw faces as they are. But Jacob said to me, the way to get out of your symbol set is to create a new one. You'll, you'll always need one, but you need to create a new one. So he said to me, just look at the face of the person you're drawing, imagine a clock face directly superimposed over it, and then just make a beautiful expression, make tilts in time, make tilts in time. In other words, just see, I'm looking at this wonderful woman right in front of me, where the, the axis of her neck and head go. Is it five past one? Is it seven past one? Maybe it's somewhere between five past one and seven past one. Now it's gone all the way over <laughs> to three o'clock. By making those minute adjustments, asking yourself that my, those minute questions on a dial, on a figure that you knew and to some sense could make sense of, could control. Week after week after week, I began to be able to look at faces and represent them with more fluidity, lucidity, than I ever thought was possible. He sent me the same task when looking at the, uh, uh, the body, the play of light and shadow on a, on a naked body, which is what you do in life drawing. Again, if you ever stare into that beautiful play of chiaroscuro on a naked model, it's dazzling in its variety, its uncertainty, the play of shadow and light. It's why we are dazzled by the great draftsmen, why when we look at a Renaissance drawing, a Michelangelo or Leonardo, we can scarcely believe the caressing opticality of its surface. But Jacob said to me, don't look at that. Look for new shapes that you've never seen before. Stare into Nate's body. Nate was one of our models. 
and see if somewhere in his torso you see in that play of light, you see the outline of a little African nation. You know how African nations have kind of uneven uh, lines, he said. Or see if you can see the profile of someone. Maybe it's a snooty butler with his nose up in the air. And you, I would stare and begin to see those kinds of definable shapes. And there again, you break out of your symbol set, Jacob showed me, not simply by observing, but by trying to observe in it from a new point of view, by shaking up, by shaking up your symbol set and leading yourself or being led into regions of observation you had never broached before. Week after week, month after month, sitting in Jacob's atelier, I never became an accomplished draftsman, but I began to make sense of the task of turning the play of light on a human body into a series of marks on a piece of paper. He taught me, too, that never to hold a pencil. I'll give you this one little recipe. Never hold a pencil this way, which is what I was doing. I was like stabbing like a Hitchcock villain. But to hold it underneath with a loose wrist and make marks and follow the web, the skein of marks, as it began to describe the object you wanted. And he also taught me something invaluable. He taught me about the eloquence of the eraser. Every mark you make can be unmade. And the act of unmaking often creates a mark more beautiful, suggestive, and expressive than the first mark that you did make. Invites the beholder in more. That process turned out to be true over every one of the activities I fell into over the course of the past 15 years. First, you learned a set of stumbling, uncertain, schematic subroutines, which may often seem to have very little connection with your ultimate goal. And then through sheer acts of perseverance and endurance and repetition, as Justin was saying, they almost miraculously begin to turn into a seamless sequence of illusion. It's true about drawing. It's certainly true about magic, where if you watch magicians practice, they work over and over again on the simplest moves that they have to make again and again and again, until when by the time they go to perform it, you have no sense that they're doing anything. It simply becomes the seamless sequence that Justin showed us a few minutes ago. The same thing is true about boxing. Now, you wouldn't think that boxing and life drawing would have an enormous amount in common. But I took up boxing uh, a couple of years ago, again, not deliberately for the purposes of the book, but because I'd always wanted to learn to box. Um, in part because I wanted some outlet for my aggression in the Trump years. <laughs> That's true. But also because I was fascinated by the history of boxing, the lore of boxing, the poetry of boxing, if you can call it that. And I uh, began to study with an extraordinary, another extraordinary teacher, a fighter. You can f follow him on YouTube. He's a Muay Thai champion named Joey Contrada who comes from an Irish-Italian family in Boston. And just last night, uh, Joey and I put on a boxing demonstration at WBUR in Boston, which is easily the high point of my life <laughs> so far. Well, here's what's fascinating about boxing. It's exactly the same process, exactly the same kind of progress that you discover in drawing. What you're taught to do in boxing by a really good teacher is not to unleash your belligerence. The last thing you want to do is unleash your belligerence. Unleashing your belligerence is a guaranteed way to get yourself hurt, if not knocked out. Instead, you want to learn uh, how to always return to a defensive pose after you've thrown a punch. What marks a good boxer, and it's fascinating when you go on YouTube after you begin to understand something and you, and you see this, is the speed with which they retract. Not the speed with which they throw a punch, but the speed with which they retract and are back in a safe defensive position. It's a great boxer who Joey taught me to adore, named Alexis Arguello, great um, Venezuelan boxer, one in three different weight classes, maybe the most technically perfect boxer you've ever seen. And you'll just gasp at the skill with which Alexis Arguello will throw a jab and then be back in perfect form. He's like a, a, a great, the greatest ballerina, the greatest ballet dancer you've ever seen. And you learn as well that even the pattern of belligerence, the pattern of aggression, is totally choreographed uh, from the start. Jab, jab, cross, feint, hook, uppercut. 
all of those things, which when you don't know anything about them, just seem like a flurry of punches, and we say it that way, he threw a flurry of punches, is in fact as tightly choreographed as a military maneuver and can only be done in a tightly choreographed way or it will fail. Why will it fail? Because you're fighting somebody else, because you have to be constantly conscious of the presence of another who may be completely imaginary, but you can't practice boxing without imagining your opponent. The opponent may be real or it may be wholly imaginary, in my case, since I don't intend to step into a ring unless they can find some other 66-year-old writer who has been practicing a sedentary profession for the past 40 years and wants to fight in a benefit. If they can find that, I'm jumping in in my shorts. But what you learn is that you can only become lucid, just as you can only become lucid in drawing by thinking about the observer, by being engaged in the dialogue with the observer. You can only become, so to speak, lucid in boxing by imagining that opponent. So what are the, what are the things then that connect all of these activities? It's first of all, this business that we only learn accomplishment through a process of small, sequential, stubborn, resistant steps, which we have to make a commitment to persevere at learning over and over and over. We have to break it down, whatever the activity is, to its smallest steps, and then discover somewhat miraculously, time after time, that if you make that commitment, it will indeed become a seamless sequence in front of you. It should be the most self-evident, I'm sure it's self-evident to all of you that that's the case, but what's astonishing to me is that it's always the case, not just that it's the case, but that it's always the case. It's equally the case with boxing and drawing, with dancing and with doing magic. And secondly, equally important point, that you have to learn how to introduce into those seem seemingly seamless sequences, how's that for a phrase? How's that for saying it? You have to learn to introduce into them exactly what Justin was talking about at the beginning, a note of human imperfection. You have to learn how to not just do it mechanically. If Justin were standing up here before us with his eyes shut merely making the moves, it would not only be tedious, it would be ineffective. It's exactly Justin's engagement, empathetic engagement with the audience combined with his technical virtuosity that makes magic Magic, and that's true again about learning to draw. The great draftsmen we don't love simply for the perfection of their line, but for the individual handwriting of their line. That's what art historians uh, identify. We say, oh, that's a Rodin, because we see instantly the peculiar vibrato and vibration that only belongs to, to Rodin. And finally, what do we learn? We learn that you can only, in everything we do, we're engaged with everything we are. I mentioned a moment ago that I'd always wanted to box. And as I learned boxing and got more engaged in it, the person who became more and more present in front of me was my grandfather, who lived and died here in Philadelphia, who came over to what he always called this country when he was 12 years old, and who loved boxing with a passion that I was not equaled by anything else in his life except his love for dancing. He loved boxing because boxing was his connection with this country, because boxing was his form of self-expression, because boxing was a way for a poor Jewish boy to move upwards and within the hierarchies and the, and the institutions of a place like Philadelphia. His hero was the great Benny Leonard, the great lightweight fighter of the 20s and 30s. And I realized that every time I threw a punch with Joey Contrada, I was honoring my grandfather's memory and becoming more deeply engaged with who he had been and what he had given me. Those three principles, the small step that becomes a seamless sequence, the necessary introduction of human imperfection into everything we do. We don't love the singer's voice for its purity. We love the singer's voice for its signature vibrato. And finally, the reality that in everything we seek to accomplish, in the real nature of accomplishments, the real nature of the real work, is not the virtuosity it gives us, but the connection that it affords us. Justin, would you come up and give us one last demonstration? Uh, before we do this, I just want to preface that I will be, again, teaching this. And there is always, pretty much 100% of the time, when you learn how a magic trick uh, is accomplished, a pretty tremendous sense of sort of letdown or disappointment. Oh, that thing's just taped to that thing? Or that, it's, 
it's typically much less glamorous than our mind will make it out to be, okay? Will you help me out here for a second? You're just gonna reach out and just grab one of these. The, the classic pick a card situation, any card. You sure that's the one you want? Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't mean to make that sound so uh, skeptical. I just wanna, you okay with that? Uh, all right, I'm gonna turn around, just hold it up and so everyone can see it. And is it uh, shielded from view now, all right? Perfect. Now, without flashing the card to me, uh, yep, yeah, there you go, see? I, put it on top of the deck, please. Thank you so much. And how about a big round of applause for our awesome assistant right here, thank you very much. Card is on top of the deck. I'm gonna very, very slowly and carefully tell you what's about to transpire. I'm gonna cut the deck, snap my fingers, say, of course, the real work, and it's gonna turn face up. The real work. And watch, it's turned face up. <laughs> Are they lying? No, no. Oh. it's not. Oh. Oh. Hold on a second, not to get into my lawyer bag here, but remember I said it's going to turn face up. I didn't say that your card was going to turn face up, right? So this is still impressive. Something turned face up. I think it's, it's thin. It's a thin stretch. But hold on. I did say it's going to turn face up, and it wasn't specified if it was going to be your card or not. What if instead of this being a mistake or an accident, what if this is actually a bit of a clue for us? This five, what if it's telling us something that we should count down one, two, three, four, five cards puts us right here. What if we were able to find your card? The 10 of hearts? <laughs> the four of diamonds. <laughs> oh, yeah, but. This space, this group, tonight, this is the real magic here. This is the real work. What if in the process, we were also able to locate the one, the two, <laughs> the three, Beautiful. and the four Beautiful. aces right there? Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. You guys want to learn how to do this? Yes. This trick is incredibly easy to perform. It's the kind of thing where you're almost going to feel guilty doing it, OK? <laughs> um, there's some cool customiza customization options on this so you can end displaying the four aces which is typically what I do but you can do this with any four of a kind with the exception of the fives right. because you're using one of the fives as your marker so you can go ace two threes four six seven eights nines tens jacks queens kings and I say that just because let's say you have a, a nephew or grandson or someone who's having an eighth birthday you could pick the four eights to have this be sort of a customized for their uh, event type of thing. So you're gonna get your four of a kind. This is basically what we magicians refer to as a stack, and it's a very small little stack at the bottom. Your four of a kind goes on the bottom, face down. Then you have your face up car, uh, five that goes right on top of it. it. can be any of the fives. And then you have the rest of the deck. Now you'll notice the deck, the rest of the deck is gone, and that's by design because during this routine, one thing I want to do is uh, narrow the focus down to only the main players. So I, my feeling is that if, if you have the rest of the cards, a little like that other routine I was talking about, just too many other characters in the mix, it gets a little confusing. So we'll go over that in a second, but I just have to get this out from behind the battery pack. There we go. So we have the full deck all face down. And then in the very bottom, we have a five and our four aces, okay? Now, the only really handling thing that you need to do on this is if you're having a card selected and somebody's being stubborn and not kind of reaching out to get a card, you don't want to spread down too far and flash that five. So you're just kind of going to take a little tight grip on that bottom portion of the deck and just spread that top portion out. Let's say this card is selected right here, four of clubs, all right? Now, you're gonna, the, the beauty of this trick is that there's really no work involved. It's very, very uh, set up. Really, you just have to follow the scripting and the procedure, and it's really very much self-working. So you get the card back, you're gonna put it right on top of the deck, and you're gonna say, you know, however you're gonna do this, you, the important point is that you are uh, very vague. 
You're intentionally vague. So you're going to say, I'm going to cut the deck, snap my fingers, and it's going to turn face up. And you want to say it, not your card, because obviously everybody's going to assume, you know, a card was just selected. Clearly that's the focus. Everyone thinks that the it is the card. But you're going to sort of feign the, the mistake. And full disclosure, I tend to milk the awkward mistake moment perhaps a little too much. I sort of enjoy it a little bit. But, uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to want that moment to be able to be seeming pretty authentic. So you say it's going to turn face up. Get right here. I spread down. Oh, I missed it somehow. There we go. Now, as soon as I get to my face up five, what I do is I grab every card above that five and I ditch it. Put it, throw it in my back pocket. If I'm working at a table, I'll put it off to the side, sort of tucked around something. I want to get the rest of those cards out of play as soon as possible. So now I just wait. Now, I'm performing for a lot of people here. It was pretty clear right away that wasn't the card that was chosen. Sometimes if you're performing for five or six people, depending on who they are and if they're super nice, you may need to goad this reaction out of them. They may just be giving you kind of weird looks, like, yeah. You said, oh, you seem unimpressed. Was that not your card? But typically when you're doing this, most people will pretty quickly say, oh, that's not our card. That's not our card. So now you kind of pause for a moment. You do the whole legalistic thing about, oh, well, I, I, did, I said it's going to turn face up, not your card, right? And now you're going to sort of pretend you're sort of wheels turning and you're going to bring them along for the ride here. Hey, what if this isn't a mistake or an accident? What if this is more of a clue? Now, notice what's happening here. Right here, as I count the four, right? One, two, that's our four aces, three, four, and there's the fifth card right there, okay? So again, this was the top, and then just by cutting the deck, we put the chosen card in the fifth position from the face up five. It's so easy. It's, <laughs> I told you, you're, you're going to feel a little guilty doing it, kind of. So uh, there we go. So you go one, two, three, four. And when I get to the fifth, I like to sort of push it forward, pinch it with my fingers, because what I want to do is separate this card right away. Then again, the rest of the deck that's underneath that spot, I'm going to ditch as well. Again, it's a little more. There's a battery pack back there. But now, if you're like me and you want to milk the awkwardness, you can then do a miss call on that. So it's the four of clubs. And I say, your card, the queen of hearts. And people are like, oh, God, dude, you got it wrong again. But you also don't have to do that. Reveal the card. And at this point, you pause for a moment, OK? Because the, most people are pretty impressed just by this <laughs> point. But now you have this sort of what we magicians refer to as a kicker ending up your sleeve, which is the revelation of the four of a kind. So I like to just sort of pause for a moment, let this kind of sink in. And then you say, uh, you know, what if our you know, magical energy here tonight is so strong that we were also able to locate the and you just slowly turn them over, put them in the front, the one, two, three, and the four aces. And I'll show you how quickly, it is, uh, how quickly the reset is. There you go, I have my four aces. I throw my five back on, boom, and there you go. And this thing's ready to perform again <laughs> right away. So there you go. Thank you, Justin, that's beautiful. As you know, and if you may have noticed, Justin, without our collaborating on it, gave, in, introduced exactly all the elements, technical virtuosity and the deliberate introduction of artful imperfection right. into the thing. Um, I know we've got to um, uh, go soon, but I think we have time for a couple of questions. So I was Adam, all that time that you spent drawing, it sounds like it was a, like months, year yes. plus or whatever. A couple of years, yeah. Was there a point where you hit on something where even you could take a step back and say, I like that so much that for posterity for whomever it may be, I'm going to have that framed. I want to keep that. I never got to the I'm going to have that framed moment. <laughs> and I certainly think my wife never got to the we're going to have that framed moment. But I certainly got to the moment when the reward was very real. I don't know if I put it well, well, but you know, one of the things that happens in the process of taking all those stumbling steps and turning them into a sequence is you get in touch with what we sometimes call the flow that extraordinary state when you feel complete absorption in what you're doing. There's a kind of sequence, a, a feedback of what you're looking at and what you're making. And that's like the cognitive opiate of human beings when we have that moment. And I certainly, there are certain drawings I associate with that, with that feeling. If I had a PowerPoint, I would show them to you. They're not good in the sense of being actually good, but they're good in the sense that they pr produced for me exactly that cognitive opiate, that sense of the flow that drove me forward to, to do more. And appreciated all the more what a truly great draftsman is capable of doing, or woman, obviously. 
Someone else. So with your boxing exploits, did anybody actually hit you? Did you have any? My teacher did, did you, accidentally. Did you have pain and suffering? And I trained for a while with my brilliant 20-year-old uh, daughter, Olivia, who's very much a character in the book, because we also took up dancing together. And um, Joey, my wonderful Muay Thai champion fighting coach, says that he has to take a day off after he trains Olivia. Olivia is the most uh, um, uh, beautifully ambitious and aggressive person. So Olivia slugged me a couple of times. But we all live to be slugged by our daughters on, on occasion. <laughs> So I, I want to point to a, a dichotomy in what you're describing and see if you can help me understand it. In the beginning, you talked about the difference between achievement and accomplishment. In when someone in their real life accomplishes something it, and pursues it and pursues it, uh, it's often because they find they have some natural predilection or gift for it. What you were mostly talking about, apparently in your book, was working hard at things that you apparently don't have a natural predilection for. So I'm trying to understand how you can learn about the former from what you undertook in your book. It's a good question. And somebody, a, a, an intelligent reviewer of the book, you don't run into many of those, but <laughs> said the real sub-theme, the kind of the hidden, every book has to have a clandestine theme to go along with the overt theme, is writing. Because that's the one thing I'm obsessed with. I do every day, have done every day, six hours a day for 40 years without a day off. So that's my craft. That's what I know how to do. But I can't really be aware. I've done it for so long, and I've done it so, so much, that I'm only aware of my discontent with it. It's one of the signs that we're good at something, I think, is that we're unhappy with our own performance in doing it. It's one of the ways you know a master at something is that they never, they never think they are. They, they only are discontent with it. So I think that's generally true about the things we're good at is that we have an, uh, I don't want to say awkward, but we have a, a unique relationship with those things. And one of the ways we can begin, I think, to understand how we ever got good at anything is by being bad it's something else. And that was the psychological fascination of it for me. And beyond the truth that all of these things were things I wanted very much to do, and I accepted in advance that I wasn't going to be good at them, but that they were worth pursuing. The, the kind of key chapter in the book is about driving, which I didn't get to discuss tonight, because uh, we were thinking about magic so much and, and art. But I learned to drive when I was in my 50s, uh, because I had never had the, the chance before, and I was often discouraged. By do, from doing it, um, and by my father, by my wife, by my children, by anyone who knew me, <laughs> except one very dear friend who encouraged me. Um, and so being able to do that was very important to my sense of autonomy and empowerment and all of those things. And what was fascinating to me is, though you wouldn't want to drive in a car with me for too long, nonetheless, it was the same process. And the sense of accomplishment that I felt that, not of achievement because there was no achievement, everybody drives, right? There's no big deal about it. The sense of inner accomplishment for me was so enormous that when I get on a plane in the morning and I flash my driver's license instead of my passport, it's a huge high, right, you know, <laughs> that, that I have. So I think that's the, that's the special value of, of, of attempting the, those, those things. And also, as I say, that inevitably, in anything new that we struggle to do, no matter how poorly we do it, we reconnect with some piece of our lives that we had overlooked or forgotten about or that we uh, were not uh, deeply. The last chapter of the book is about boxing and dancing, because I was boxing and did not know that I was honoring my grandfather until I was deeply into it. And I was dancing with my daughter and did not know that we were having a deeper conversation in the steps of the foxtrot than we, were, than we could have over the dinner table. So all of those things, I think, feed into it. Not so much related to the book, but I'm really curious about how you feel your growing up in Philadelphia influenced all your values, including what led to the book. What a wonderful place, what a wonderful question to end on. I used to joke that I lived in Paris for many years and it felt familiar because Paris and Philadelphia are architecturally very similar. They're both Beaux-Arts City with grand boulevards and so on. Um, I, I think the, the, the simplest way to answer that is that, um, you know, we, we don't just grow up in a city, we grow up in a family in a city. 
and I was blessed to have uh, uh, parents who lived for the arts. And Philadelphia is actually a wonderful city to grow up in if you have parents who live for the arts. So we spend enormous amounts of time every weekend in the museum and in the Franklin Institute and in the Rodin Museum and in the Pennsylvania Museum, the Anthropological Museum, still terrifies me, the nail fetishes in that, in that museum. And so that sense that the arts were present and my father, uh, bless him, would take me to the Academy of Music uh, on, to hear Eugene Ormandy in those days and the Philadelphia Orchestra. The arts were made very much part of the everyday woof and, and weave of my life and that was especially available here in Philadelphia. We then moved to Montreal, which is a town I love very much, but not nearly as culturally rich as Philadelphia is. I don't know if Philadelphians adequately appreciate how culturally rich and this city is, not least of all in possessing one of the world's great libraries. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for listening.